Hi, I'm Silvia Zacarias, and today we bring you another episode of Education Matters. And with me, we have the current Region 19 Teachers of the Year. We have Ms. Jocelyn Suñiga. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi. Jocelyn teaches fifth grade uh, at San Elisario ISD. And with us, we have also Mr. Juarez. He teaches at Canotillo Middle School uh, Science. So uh, welcome to Thank both you. of you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being here uh, this afternoon. Um, and we're going to have a very candid conversation. So let's go ahead and get started. So one of the first questions that I have for you is, when they announced you, Ms. Suñiga, as the teacher of the year for the this for the whole region what was the first thing that came to your mind first place elementary winner jocelyn suñiga oh wow a lot of emotions were rushing in i think i cried a lot i it was i really wasn't expecting it like it, it's it's such an honor and i never thought of myself as like this the best teacher or whatever. Um, I always felt that I didn't have as much experience, that there was like a long way to go for me to actually call myself like an experienced teacher. So of course, when I was standing there, part of you, right, wants to win. Who doesn't? Of course. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. But in my mind, there was like, there's no way I'm going to win. Like, especially getting to know all the teachers um, there were some amazing teachers and I was like, mm, I think this one's going to win. No, maybe this one. <laughs> but I never thought that I was going to be the lucky one. So what do you think was that key point that the judges said? It's it's Ms. Suñiga. What was it? And you, what do you think it was that critical point? I think it was, I think the best advice that I got from one of my closest friends, she actually uh, one um, Region 19 district, uh, Region 19 teacher of the year, and then she was one of the finalists for state. So of course, when I won, she was so happy, and then um, she told me, "Just speak from the heart. You just need to speak from the heart. Let them see you, the real you, and everything's gonna be fine." Um, and I thought, yeah, I, I just went in with that mentality, speaking from the heart, speaking about uh, why I went into the profession. And I think that's what made the difference. Nice. Nice. So a lot of emotions going through yes. at that moment. <laughs> uh, Mr. Juarez, how about you? The moment we have all been waiting for, I'm pleased to announce our 2023 Region 19 Secondary Teacher of the Year. Drum roll, please, sir. Hector Juarez. To be honest with you, I was kind of nervous because I wrote my speech and I put it on one side and I wrote the groceries list and I put it on the other side. <laughs> and I couldn't remember is did I put my speech or maybe I just have my groceries list. So I was kind of like, so when they announced my name, I was kind of, I hope, I hope I did put my, my little the speech one. there because I, I wanted to thank all the, all the teachers and my administrators and my peers that actually motivated me and inspired me. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it, it, it was a great experience, but uh, I, I was glad that I did have my little speech in there. Right. But so, yes. which, again, going back to the question that I asked Ms. Sunika, what do you think was the defining factor uh, that, that maybe um, stood out to the judges to say Mr. Juarez should be the secondary teacher of the year? You know what? The essence of education is learning. If you don't have learning, you don't have education. And the heart and soul of learning, it's the relationship between the facilitator and the student. And in this case, the facilitator, and, and there's so many facilitators, but in this case, will be the teacher. Uh, it's, it's all about building that relationship, not only uh, between the facilitator, the teacher in this case, and the student, but also the relationship between the scholar and the peers, the scholar and the school environment. But the most important thing that I think stood with them was the fact that I've mentioned a lot is the importance of building that relationship between the scholar and self. It's about building that character, not only of uh, self-responsibility and integrity and uh, grit, but also of compassion and kindness. 
And I think that's one of the things that actually, I think that it just got their attention. If I were to ask your students, how would you describe Mr. Juarez in one word? What would be the, I guess, the, um, the most, uh, the responses, maybe the most, uh, the, the, the word or the adjective that would describe you the most? I had, a, I had an experience with one of the parents, uh, actually it was like maybe three weeks ago, and uh, this parent actually asked, Mr. Juarez, I, I, I need to speak to you because I'm kind of concerned. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, you know, my concern is that you treat uh, your students differently, and I want to know why. And I said, well, let's talk about it. Let's, let's actually talk about it. So we sat down, and, um, and I did ask him. I said, do you have kids? I said, and, and the parents said, yes, I have two. I said, do you love your kids the same way? And the parents said, yes, with all my heart. I love them the same way. I said, now, I'm going to ask you this question, but I want you to be honest with me. I said, do you treat your kids the same way? And he thought about it, and he couldn't answer and I told the parents, I said, look, you don't have to answer that question. I said, I have two daughters, and I love them. One is 16, the other one's 13. And I love them the same way, and I don't favor one over the other one. But I don't treat them the same way. And the reason why is because they have different needs. And I told them, I said, as a science teacher, out of the 100 billion people that have existed in this planet, no one has ever had, and no one will ever have your fingerprints, because we're all unique. We all have a story to tell. So that's why I treat kids differently. Uh, if, the, if, if you were to ask one of my, my students, uh, what is the one thing is he understands me. He treats me uh, as a human being. He treats me uh, you know, as, with respect. And I think that's one of the most important things as a teacher is to differentiate, understand that. And, and once you understand that and have that connection, and that's why I believe that the, the heart and soul of learning is that relationship, that relationship between the scholar and, and the teacher. And that what you just said is differentiate. And as teachers in the educational world, we always talk about differentiated instruction. Correct. But here you're talking and, and, and focusing on differentiating the individual Correct. and the needs and the personalities, right? Correct. Correct. So that is, that is a, a very nice uh, experience that you had. Correct. And I think that the parent walked away understanding why you know the i guess uh, the answer to to their to their concern to his concern correct okay nice so what about you Ms. Sonica? what what word would do you think your students say that describes you before i answer let me just tell you you see what i mean by like the wonderful teacher yeah. like isn't he amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um i think that with me the way that um they would describe me as uh, very loving. Loving. I'm very loving. They know I, I truly care about them, even because I, I am also very strict, but it not in like, oh, is she so mean? Like they know, and I, and I make it a point to tell them like, if I'm being hard on you, it's because I care about you. If I didn't care, I would let you do whatever you want. But because I really care about you, I really care about your future, that's why I have high expectations. Right. So as a matter of fact, um, last Friday, was it Friday? Someday I left early and when I came back, there was a, a note in my desk. And it was um, this uh, little girl that all year, she had issues with everyone. She, um, she comes from a hard, uh, at risk family, hard background. And um, she doesn't have a mom, so I try to show that love to her because kids that come to school uh, that are loved at home come to learn, but those that yeah. don't, they come so that they, they can feel loved. Right. So she she wrote it on her letter and she's like, I, I forgive me for every time that I have misbehaved. And then she's like, um, I know that you're hard on us because you really care about us and I am, am I really thankful. And, I was crying wow, because what, what a beautiful note. Yes, it was very beautiful. I guess it, it took getting to know you and all this time to finally understand, you know, that you, you both of you are educators, we're all educators. And if we are not in the education business, um, because I mean, we have to have that love for, for children, for teaching and learning. 
And like you said it yourself, you know, relationships and caring. I think that that should be the norm. That should be one of the first things as of why we decided to become teachers in the first place. That was very nice to hear. So um, I'm going to ask you another question. So how has this, and I, 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 I'm sorry if I, if I failed to mention that Ms. Uniga is the uh, Regional Elementary Teacher of the Year, and Mr. Juarez is the uh, Secondary Teacher of the Year here at Region 19. So how has this changed your personal life and also your professional life since you were awarded this title? Want me to go? There you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, for me, I'll be honest with you, this profession is always, you're always on the go. Always on the go. You know, day one, you're already behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, but it was nice to kind of reflect, reflect on your teaching, reflect on the, on the, on the pedagogy of teaching, reflect on, on why you do what you do. Because a lot of times you have it, but a lot of, you know, it's just that self-reflection, that, that time where you have to, is why do I do what I do? And I think that's very important because when you understand that and you understand why you do what you do, everything makes sense. Everything you do makes sense. Uh, a lot of my friends, I've been teaching for 20 years now and they still ask me, uh, you're still teaching, you're still a teacher? But now I can say like uh, Tom Cruise and uh, Maverick, yeah, but a highly decorated teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, for me, it was that. It was, it was that giving me that time to actually reflect. So a lot of times you don't have that time. And it was kind of nice to, to really understand it's like, it was worth it. It was worth it, reflecting on all those years. Uh, it's a very noble profession. It's all about giving. This is yes. all about serving others. Absolutely. It's not about, you know, having that pat on the back uh, it's, it's all about just giving and uh, that that's what I take from this is it's uh, I'm grateful that I had that time to to reflect on why I do what I do yes. this is gonna be a very emotional question I already feel that I want to start <laughs> crying and I haven't even <laughs> answered um, this recognition came to my life um, during a very tough time. I couldn't understand why God allowed me to, to be recognized at such high level when I felt like I wasn't doing anything right. I had lost my husband. My husband uh, passed away um, a year and a half ago. And uh, it was hard getting up every day and going to school, but those kids, man, they don't know that they were the ones that brought me back to life because I, <laughs> I didn't feel like I, I wanted to do anything. And they're the ones, of course, my kid kept me going and at work, they were the ones that kept me going. Um, I was having a hard time. I had to, uh, thank you. <laughs> Just one, thank you. Um, I had to move in with my parents because I couldn't stand being alone at my house. I had a very, very, very hard time with one of the students. Like I know every year you get those students, right, that you struggle with behavior, but I had always find a way to connect with them and try to motivate him. And with this one, no matter what I did, I just couldn't. And as a teacher, I was very frustrated. I remember that the day before uh, they announced at my school that I was a teacher of the year for my campus, I called my mom crying and I said, I just feel defeated. Like I can't be able to be by myself at my house. I can't, I'm not able to connect with this kid. I'm like, I don't have my, like I'm, I'm, I'm just a failure. I'm a big time failure. And of course, like every loving mother, she's like, no, you're doing this and look at that. and. Next day, I walked in all defeated, and then somebody walks in with a big bouquet of roses to tell me that I was teacher of the year. And, and um, so it did change me. Like, I, I, I really saw that uh, resilience that was in me, that, that I felt like I was not good enough, and, but I was doing all of this. And, and my, my biggest thing is I 
I didn't come to the profession because of the money. <laughs> I came into the profession <laughs> because of the kids. Yeah. So knowing that I was making an impact not only on the kids but on my colleagues, because I'm going to be honest, at first I thought, oh, I just won because they feel sorry for me. Like, ay, pobrecita, she doesn't have her husband anymore. That's honestly how I felt. Because like I mentioned, like I didn't, I didn't consider myself like an experienced teacher. So I just thought I'm um, just like a consolation prize, right? But then hearing everybody talk about how happy they were that I had won and that, that I was an inspiration to them, like made me change the switch and say, oh my God, like it's not because they feel sorry for me. It's because they're inspired because I'm going through all of this and I I, I keep going. And my kids saw that too. And I, they also like, I'm not the only one that's hurting at school. Like there are a bunch of kids that are going through uh, hard things at home. Yes. And and being able to connect with me at that level and say, if Ms. Zuniga can do it, if she can keep going, like I can do it too. So I I think that um, that challenged me as a teacher to be be better and, and try to use my story to inspire those kids. Um, so, so that's how, how it impacted my life. It was a huge impact that had yeah. uh, to you. Uh, and, and, and like you're saying, being in that very vulnerable moment, um, this helped you uh, I guess, realize the impact that you're making without knowing it. Yes. Um, what do you think your husband would tell you now? <laughs> you know what I thought about that the first day um, that I walked into the classroom? My husband passed away one week before us going back to school. And at first, I didn't want to go back. I was looking at ways that I could stay home longer, and I just took five days. I started school day one with my kids and I was really scared. I was like, what if I break down in the middle of class and they're gonna say, what's wrong with this lady? <laughs> um, but the moment those kids walked in, I mean, they're my life. And I was just, I forgot. It's like I left everything that I was feeling, I left it outside and I was just devoted to them, getting to know them. And for a minute I thought, if my husband could see me right now, he'd be happy because he always thought that I was the best teacher. Oh, that's beautiful. And you know what? You are. You're so resilient. And uh, it is an honor to have you, both of you, here and also representing Region 19. Uh, you have your, your heart, so you have your soul invested in this profession. You talked about building relationships. You talked about uh, being facilitators. You talked about even you nurturing yourself as well. Uh, and you're talking about also caring. So imagine going through something like this in your life, but you're still yet there in the classroom, getting your students, supporting them. So this is just amazing to see the caliber of, of teachers that we have at Region 19. Um, I'm going to ask you two more questions. Um, there is one question, well, actually maybe three, just, just real quick. Um, there is, there is this, uh, idea behind uh, teachers of the year. Like, well, if you're teacher of the year is because you know everything, right? Even me as a parent, my daughters tell me, well, aren't you teacher? Don't you know the answer to this? I'm like, well, no, I don't know that specific part because I'm staying on my lane. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> kinder. So you're asking me a secondary question or something to that matter. But what are those maybe misconceptions that we have about teachers of the year? What do you think should are those, or have you heard, or have you experienced? Well, for me, is that we're not perfect. We make mistakes. That we're still learning. I mean, we're scholars ourselves, and I think that's a big misconception: is that well, you're teacher of the year. You know, you should not make mistakes. I said, well, no, actually, I, I make a lot of mistakes, and I'm still learning. Uh, but I think that's one of the one of the misconceptions that we still have, and I experienced that this year. A lot of times with my parents, you know, uh, like I said, that parent that I talked to about differentiating and treating kids differently based on their needs, uh, that's the first thing that he told me. Well, you're reaching 19 teacher of the year. Why are you treating kids differently? Why are you doing this? So 
I think that's a that, that's a big misconception is that we're we're not perfect. We're human beings. We're learning. Uh, it just happens to be, and it was an honor, you know. And anyone could have won that night. I, to me, it's like I, you know, I look up to my to my to my peers, to Miss Suni, the excellent teacher. I mean, she just inspired me right now, you know, <laughs> because it takes a big heart. What do we do? It's not an easy, mm -hmm. easy task. Mm -hmm. It's it's we're not dealing with robots. We're not dealing with machines. We're dealing with human beings. Yes. Human beings that are trying to find answers to a lot of the questions yes. that they have. Uh, so uh, one of the biggest misconceptions is that I mean, I have 150 students uh, and I have to be at my A game every day, yeah. even if I have you know, situations where my wife or my kids are sick or, you know, my parents. Are, and I have to forget that because my responsibility, the moment those kids step into that classroom, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's time to give them, you know, the, 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 you know, the support and facilitate those conditions that they need in order for them to grow. Uh, so I think that's one of the mega, biggest misconceptions is we're not perfect. We make mistakes, yeah. you know, and, um, and for me that has been has been my experience well very similar with me um i had that misconception like teacher of the year is the best one she knows uh everything she's the most experienced she knows how to help every kid uh with their needs and it, it, it's not true like I, I mentioned before i was very surprised that i was chosen as a uh, region 19 teacher of the year uh because of that because i don't feel experienced and like i said this our uh, recognition challenge means it was not like oh i'm teacher of the year <laughs> it was like oh my god i'm teacher of the year i need to step it up uh, so that i can better um, serve my students um, and just also that people have the, con the misconception that just because you're teacher of the year you might have like the best scores on campus okay. and Sometimes you're you're learning with the kids. This is after three years being a sixth grade teacher. This is my first year back to teaching reading. So and then star change recently. So I was learning with my kids. Right. So I, I hope that I helped them uh, get to where they had to be. I feel very proud of them. Um, this year we took the, we started with map testing. And in reading uh, out of 20, and that's something I'm very proud of because I was struggling the whole year. Uh, out of the 28 students that I have in my homeroom, just four of them didn't show the expected growth. Everybody else grew. Uh, I'm not saying that they're where they're supposed to be, but at the end of the day, There's that's growth. what I told them. I just need you to show me growth because then that means that you're learning. You, you might not be where you're, that where you're supposed to be and it's okay sometimes it takes time but you'll get there as as long as you you're showing growth and they did and i, I i'm i'm very happy That's because awesome. of that in talking about reading so this podcast is made possible um because of our uh, west texas reading symposium we received a grant uh and the grant uh, it's it's about reading uh, and you just mentioned about reading uh, the scores and how you're looking at and seeing the growth of your students. So tell me more or less, how do you see um, the impact on, on, I guess, those reading strategies or instruction that you have given to your students? Now, granted, it's already 2023, the year, and we recently had that pandemic we know that there is uh, gaps here and there with our students so have you seen something like this and if you have what are you doing to help those students close gaps specifically in the area of reading instruction well there's always been a gap like there's always students uh, you're right there's no year where you say all of my kids yes. are great that, that is right uh but the pandemic did do a lot of harm um this year like i said i for the past three years, I I was teaching sixth grade, so it's it's been quite a while since I taught uh, reading. And this year, when I came back, like I was okay, let's DRA students, let's, and I was very surprised. I had, like I mentioned, I had a pretty big class. Um, I want to say that only three 
or four were reading at grade level. Everybody else was reading second grade and below. So two out of how many? Two or three? 28 that okay. I have in my homeroom. And that's just counting my homeroom. That's not going into the other right. um, section that I see just in my homeroom. So I knew since day one that uh, it was going to be hard mm -hmm. getting them um, to increase that level just because I had kinder levels. I had first, second, I had a couple of, of third grade levels, but for the most part, everyone was second grade and below, which at fifth grade, um, that's really concerning, right? Because uh, that yes. when they come and, yeah. <clears throat> and take the STAR test, they're not gonna be, and, and we talk about differentiating. Yes, of course, I get them things at their level, but at the end of the day, they have to perform at great level. Right. So um, one of the things I did and I just, the only way to get better in reading is to read. Right, yes, So Practice. I encourage them, okay, take, let's, let's read. And I read novels with them and I tried to get uh, things uh, or read about things that I knew would be relevant to them so that they could um, be engaged into the reading because I know that not everybody likes to read. And it's hard to yeah. to have kids read um, and, and because they're not at grade level, they're not engaged. So I had to, to find ways to make it engaging. Of course, I did a lot of guided reading, pulling my groups. And when I was at pulling groups and doing small group, I had the other ones uh, working at intervention at their level. I used things like iStation, iExcel. Um, so just trying to to help them, I, it, there was a lot of, of guided reading, small group, and just trying to get them um, things that were relevant to them. Okay. So having different strategies <clears throat> yes. and having them oh, provide experiences, multiple yes. and different experiences for them to, to apply that. Yes, I nice. even did a, a reading bingo. Mm -hmm. So I had a card of bingo and, you, and I put like a chapter book or a graphic novel and they had to fill the whole thing and the first one to win got a prize. So, so it was just about, a motivation for them to keep reading. <laughs> talking about how uh, relevancy, right? Yeah. Nice. Um, Dr. Mr. Juarez, so you teach science sure. in the middle school. So how have you noticed any maybe issues maybe with the reading and if you do how do you help your students because your main focus is is science mm -hmm. right? right but in order for students to learn more about science there's a lot of reading involved so tell me about your your take on that you know you know what what they do in elementary is tough uh, you know when i compare elementary and middle school is like i take my hat off because <laughs> elementary it's 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 a challenge but one of the things that I always tell my kids is you have to understand the big picture. You have to understand what is your greatest challenge. And I tell my, my students, I said, the greatest challenge you're going to face from now on is change. Everything's changing so rapidly. The jobs that we have now are not going to exist. And for that reason, you have to learn how to read. You have to be a good reader. Because if you're not a good reader, you're not going to become a lifelong independent learner. And that's what you will need in order to succeed. That's what you will need in order to come. I said, you know, yes, you, you, in order to make it, when you guys graduate, yes, you're gonna have to spark that imagination, that creativity, that innovation, that collaboration. Those are skills that you will need. But the basis of that is your reading skills, your writing, your yes. thinking. Absolutely. Uh, and definitely reading is very important. And so what I try to do with them is, for me, it's, it's inspire them and, and for them to understand the big picture. Why do we do what we do? There's always a reason why we do what we do. There's a reason why you read. There's a reason why you write, you know, and it's, 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 it's understanding that there has to be an ultimate goal. What is your ultimate goal? What is your purpose in this life? So, and that's the beauty of working with middle schoolers. You know, when I work with, uh, with elementary, because I taught elementary for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I taught uh, uh, fifth grade for 10 years and fourth grade for five. And I would talk to my, 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 um, my students about things like that, and they just would not get it. Mr. Okay, can we go outside and play? <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, it's just a different, a right. different, different need. But with middle school, especially eighth graders, is you can have those conversations. And I always tell them, I said, you want to make it in life? You have to read. I mean, there's no, 
There's no easy way out. There's no shortcut. I said, whatever you want to do, if you want to put sal burritos, a better reader, a better reader will give you a better outcome. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do. If you want to, you know, be a musician, you have to learn how to read that contract. You have to learn how to think. Yeah. You have to be a lifelong independent learner and Absolutely. thinker. So reading, it's important. And we, we, you know, in science, it's like you said, one of the things that I try to do is uh, my, my uh, English teachers are my best friends because I do teach uh, science, but I always tell them, hey, there's a couple of uh, science passages that we can kind of work together, mm -hmm. you okay. know, and it's the importance of alignment. It's the yes. importance of working together. That collaboration. So that collaboration. So working as a department, uh, that's one of the things that I do, and uh, I, I always try to learn from them too as well as how to, you know, introduce vocabulary in because they're the experts in that field. So I try, I try to do that a lot. So I'm always learning from my peers. I'm learning from the Suniga right now, kind of getting ideas too. It's like, okay, let's, yes. let's play that bingo, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know what? Maybe for our next uh, West Texas Reading Symposium, that it's going to happen in February next year, we might just maybe um, knock on your door to see if you would be willing to be a presenter and talk about maybe those reading. Uh, uh, strategies that you include in your in your classroom that would be great to have so I'm going to leave you the, with this question um, and again thank you so much for being here today uh, they were teaching today and they had they asked for permission and thank for thank you to principals and administration of Canutillo Middle School and also Alarcón Elementary in San Elisario ISD for allowing them to come here for this podcast so my last question to you is the following now that you are Teachers of the Year and you're going to be in the history and the books of Region 19, right? What is your responsibility now, not only to yourself, to your students, to the community? So what is our responsibility that you think or that you have now? Because yes, people are looking at you like, hey, he or she is a Teacher of the Year. So then let's look at the uh, self-reflection piece right now. Internally, what is my responsibility from now on towards my students more than anything to me as a person, as a teacher? What's your take on that? Um, well, like I, um, like I said before, uh, it definitely challenged me as a teacher. So just because uh, somebody's gonna, uh, gonna win doesn't mean like, oh, I'm not challenged anymore. Like, I'm just gonna, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm like, done, I'm done. Light drop. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, like you said, I'm gonna be in the, in the book of history, right? <laughs> After 19. So I'm always gonna be a leader. Um, and even, even teachers that haven't um, won, like, um, Mr. Juarez said, like anybody could have won that that yes. night, right? We were we were blessed enough we were, we were. to be chosen that night, um, and because and next year there's gonna be a new one, but um, we're always gonna be leaders, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the the biggest thing is that I I, I want to see if I remember this quote. Um, it says that leadership is about making others better as a result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So that's that's how you see your responsibility moving forward. What yes. about you, Mr. Weiss? You know, for me, at the end of the year, I always ask my kids to say, what did you like the most about uh, this year? And, you know, they've, they've always said, your stories. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to finish with the story that I have. Uh, the story that I have for this one is there were three tradesmen and they were doing the same thing. The three of them were doing the same thing. And there's a little girl that comes along and asks the first tradesman, sir, what are you doing? I'm just, uh, I'm just laying brick. You're just laying brick? Yes. So she turns around, goes to the second tradesman. Uh, sir, what are you doing? Well, I I'm building a wall. Okay. You're, you're just building a wall? Yes. So finally, she goes to the third traceman and asks the same question. Sir, what are you doing? I said, Mija, I want you to look very closely. You don't see it right now, but I'm building a chapel, building a church. So the three of them were doing the same thing, but they had a different vision. One was just thinking, I'm just laying brick. The other one, I'm just building a wall. But the one, the, the third one, had a different vision. It's like, I'm not just laying brick. I'm not just building a wall. 
actually building a church. And I think the responsibility that I see myself is to continue building this nation because that's what we're doing. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's all about building the nation. We're all in this together. And uh, we have to continue raising the flag. Education more than ever is very important. Yes. Very, very important. Absolutely. And uh, we just have to continue uh, supporting each other. I have, I've always said that there's no competition. The biggest competition is with yourself. The biggest competition is how can I be a better self, a, ve a better version of myself today than yesterday. Uh, and, and, and it's the importance of working together and helping each other yes. and sharing ideas. Because at, at the end of the day, what we do, it's, it's we're building this nation. And I think that's our responsibility, in my opinion. I think that's, that's what we need to continue doing. Uh, so yeah, that's my little story. That's very nice. I like your stories. It's too. cute. <laughs> we are building the future. We are building yeah. the future. And I think with that, empathy is very, very necessary and compassion too, like you were saying. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that we, we prepare our children to a better world. Uh, and that is, it starts with us in, in our families, as parents, uh, relatives, uh, but also in our classroom. So um, it was, again, a pleasure having both of you here. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure that we all saw and watched the caliber of teachers we have here at Region 19, here in El Paso, Texas. Um, there's a lot of passion. I already said this. There's a lot of heart. Uh, and there's also a lot of learning and teaching that happens at the same time. Without learning, there's no teaching and vice versa. So thank you again. It was a pleasure. Thank you and I'm much. sure we're going to see each other again, hopefully next year at our next West, West Texas Reading Symposium. Okay. And we'll let you know the details and we'll let you know the details as well. So thank you so much. You. This is thank early. You. This is Education Matters. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.